All right, everybody, welcome to episode 63 of Empty the Bench. Uh, I'm Nick Morgison. Tom Alvano and Nick Federer will be with me in a minute or two. Just wanted to address a situation that happened yesterday. Our Twitter account had an unfortunate tweet go out about Ahmad Rosario that we need to discuss. Uh, give me a few minutes to explain the situation and then we promise we'll get back to the world of sports. We have a ton of sports to talk about, including COVID-19 taking over the world of the NFL and college football. And we have MLB stuff, NBA stuff. We have a lot to do. We have a, a great show, but we got to discuss this first. So I unfortunately jumped the gun on a news, well, a news story, possibly a video on uh, Ahmad Rosario. And uh, guys, if you could join me here now. I would appreciate that so we can talk about this. So I couldn't believe what happened yesterday. So I posted the video of uh, Ahmad Rosario with, it looked like he was with a few buddies and it looked like he was talking about the, uh, the Indians and I misinterpreted this in a major way. And just so everyone understands, and I'm going to ask you a question. Was I being malicious in any way trying to post this? No. no. What it was not a matter of being malicious. It was a matter of being irresponsible. Right. And my my whole intention was that it seemed like a news story and it was weird that he was talking about the Indians in a time that the rumors were showing that Francisco Lindor could possibly be going to the Mets, right? Yeah. Right. It's been the rumors. So when I saw the video, I said, oh, it looks like a news story, not an intent on his reputation to take him down. That was my point. It was, my point was to make it known that he could be leaving the Mets and going to the Indians. And, and what I said last night was if we had maybe posted a tweet where that he had mentioned Cle – because first of all, not none of the three of us are native Spanish speakers. We don't right. even – I don't even know how to speak Spanish, you know, like I, I took three years of it yeah, in school, but that was a long time ago. Right. Um, but basically we, but basically if we had tweeted something like quote Cleveland with the emo I emojis, you know, like or, that's, or, or, or why is he talking about Cleveland in a video that, right. that's what I would have, I should have right. said. Right. But, so, I, but if we, I'm saying if we did something out of the, you know, curiosity spectrum, I don't think any, you know, like we get any backlash or anything. And it's not that irresponsible. It I, was saying yeah. him saying that he was traded to the Indians was the irresponsible thing because, you know, uh, Pisan, Jeff, Jeff Hassan, uh, Ken Rosenthal, Anthony, they're going here in the here in New York. None of them were reporting on that, right? And I mean, we 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 strive to do we strive to take what we what we do seriously. I mean, this is this is not a major operation here. You are looking at the entirety of the empty the bench staff, and we really do take this seriously. We try to get things right, but uh, sometimes you just get things wrong. Well, but this is a learning experience. Let me say one thing. And I said it to both of you last night. I'm going to say it to everybody now. Don't blame the other two on this screen. Because they say when people do shows, when someone Fs up, like I did, trying to put up a news story, and obviously it was interpreted the wrong way, and it was wrong. Don't blame the two guys. And actually, what I should have done is gone to the two journalists who are sitting on the screen next to me, because they would have... Told me how to write this out in a better interpretation. And afterwards, I said to you guys, I should have said that it he was talking about Cleveland, and it would have been could it could it be connected to a possible trade? Is what I should have said. Could it? Yes. Could it? Could yes. It, yes. Was it? I mean, we don't know for sure. No, That's we don't the know issue. for sure. And but the the fact that you, you couldn't get you know official confirmation of that. For at least for at least three different three different people telling you telling you that it happened. I mean, it's difficult. It's difficult to play that kind of. Which is ironic. It, it's difficult to do that. 
which is ironic because I've actually said that to you guys that I believe in the whole three sources rule. So I don't know why I I totally jumped the gun in that regard. But we need to go back in the timeline for a second. So after that tweet that we deleted now, it's gone. It's been gone since last night. The Nick called me and said, uh, did you look on Twitter? He responded to the tweet. And I said, huh? I said, what do you mean he responded to the tweet? And, and I go online and I see, oh my God, he replied to the tweet. And I'm, I don't know, like, ha, ha, Nick, I think I lost it after you told me that, I think. Yeah, we, we all, we all kind of were in shock because we never get any kind of, uh, we never get that kind of feedback, positive or negative. So I said, okay, this is a problem. And then usually like in our world, we look at impressions and engagements because that's how we gauge what works in our shows. And I said, why is this at 5,000? Why is it at 8,000? I said, uh oh, this is not good. And when I saw the engagements number was up over 250, I said, okay, we've never had a tweet that's gone over 8,000 impressions. We never had an engagements go over a hundred. I said, there's a problem here. And then when I looked, I actually found an interpretation, Tom, afterwards when I did mm -hmm. some research and I realized he was talking about Cleveland in joking interpretation, which again, could be misleading because Again, they were laughing. Well, for those, the of us who, those of you who speak Spanish, you would know that we don't. So, I just wanted to say I'm sorry. I misinterpreted it the wrong way, and we'll, we'll eat any shit that comes our way. Yes, mm -hmm. and I would hope maybe one day, if he can look past this whole situation, let's. Not, I, and I said to the guys, let, not even to talk baseball. I want to get to know him as a person. That's if that could happen one day. That's all I want to say in that regard. So hopefully we can move past this and get past the negative situation. But I want to talk about a positive story in the world of baseball. Mm, that Kim, is? What? I said and that is? Kim Ning being the new GM of the Miami Marlins. She is the first woman and first uh, Asian American to be the GM of a professional sports franchise in, in a professional men's league in North American history. See, I have two thoughts and one, I'll, and one is a question is an open question. I would lead to you guys. I didn't realize she had that kind of pedigree. Holy, holy God. Is she, is she prepped for this? I mean, she won two championships with the Yankees and I didn't even realize that she was Brian Cashman's assistant GM until he brought it up yesterday. Because it wasn't paying attention that that much, but she was working for the commissioner's office mm -hmm. under Manfred or under Seelig. I think it was under Seelig. Right. Well, uh, actually, I think it was under both. Well, technically, I believe Joe Torrey was the one who brought her in. Yeah, because I I think he knew her from uh, from again her time with the Yankees. But the woman knows what she's doing, and the Marlins. Are definitely they could be a team on the rise. So you need a GM to help. Uh, again, you have a solid core, but now you need a good GM to solidify that roster, solidify what you want the team to be over the next couple of years. Because the playoffs showed us that this team can fight; they can well, compete. Right. Well, I'll I'll tell you what this is. You know, it's not so much like the fact that she has made history. In this sense, the first woman, the first Asian American general manager in all of North American sports, terrific. But I'll tell you what, I don't think Jeter's focus was on that. We mentioned that Jeter, you know, it's Derek Jeter. We mentioned that she was a part of the late 90s Yankees dynasty behind the scenes before moving on. We mentioned that Brian Cashman, you know, she worked under Brian Cashman. Brian Cashman said she was basically – a true major component of what happened behind the scenes. This is more of Derek Jeter bringing in that Yankees influence. Right. And I just think she's an, she has an incredible resume. I think she worked in the Dodgers front office too, if I'm not yeah. mistaken. She did. She has the bona fides. Mm -hmm. And I think she's going to be an amazing GM. I think it's actually perfect for the situation with 
the Marlins, who are a young, rebuilding franchise, and I think she would fit into a situation. It gives her some time to build up the experience, the years. Not that she needs more experience, but it gives her time to kind of build up a franchise from scratch and figure it out all over again. And actually build, have the building blocks and the resources to do what you need to do. But, you, I mean, you got the criticism, which is basically, you know, thinly veiled misogyny. But I, my, my thing is, my second thing is, I want to ask a question. Do mm -hmm. you think, gentlemen, that this could lead to further integration of the big leagues? Managers, maybe even players. Female. Absolutely. You Absolutely. would hope so. It should. You would hope so. I mean, I could see one day, and I know we don't talk politics, but like eventually we're going to have a female in, in the White House. Like well, we're gonna well, we do now. We're going to have a Yeah, female. we're going to ha have a female close to the White House. Vi well, vice president. What I meant was technically like holding the power yeah. position. Like, yeah. yeah. Sitting in the big, sitting in the big boy chair. Right, and I'm talking about, and we have women CEOs, it, many more now than we used to have years ago. So we're seeing the evolution well, of of these power positions. Well, it goes back to something I've said a while back. I think even when you were talking about those Rooney Rule expansions, that I had said, use an example. If I am trapped in a burning apartment building. And, you know, I need someone to rescue me. I don't care what that firefighter's gender. I don't care what their race or religion is. I, I need whoever is the best person to get me out of that situation. And uh, Yeah, anyway, get me the F out of the house. I don't care who it is. Right, and clearly, Kim, like we were saying, has the resume, has the capabilities, has the championship experience above all else. Again, that late 90s Yankees dynasty you know, to succeed. And again, like Nick was saying, we saw with this young Marlins team, I don't, did they have a, I don't think they had a winning record. I think they went into the playoffs 29 and 31. If I'm not, they mistaken. did, they did 29 and 31, but they were and, very competitive. And I was going to say, but they were competitive during the season. They came back. Remember from a massive COVID affecting, affecting the whole team and then they upset, I think it was the Cubs in the first round of the playoffs. They did. And actually, and they, it, it, go ahead, Tom. I was going to say, no, all that. And, remember, and you know, Don Mattingly, he deserved that National yeah. League Manager of the Year for all oh, that. He earned that. They, they, they played hard for Donnie. They really mm -hmm. did. He earned that award a hundred times over. Not just once, a hundred times over. It's unbelievable to me how the Marlins are, their evolution, I mean, I'm not. I'm still not sold on Derek Jeter being the the owner and this. Yeah, but you know what? He's in a lot better place than he was three years ago. Oh yeah, yeah. He, definitely. He, he definitely he definitely is. But all he needs to do is spend money and shut up, and he seems to be able to know how to do that. I, I was gonna say after, honestly after after that Stanton trade, it looks like he's the one who comes out the yeah. winner in that. He's the one who comes out smelling like a white mushroom. I mean, there's so much, and like we're gonna quickly dole through all the baseball because there was a ton of stuff going on. Right. We had we had Steve Cohen with his press conference. I was gonna say, okay, so obviously we're in some tensions with the Mets and one Mets player, but it's still a news item to talk about. Steve Cohen has been introduced as the new owner of the New York Mets. He had his introductory press conference, and he has said, you know, he basically. I think you put it on our Twitter best when you had that poll. He passed the likability test. Yes. He definitely, he definitely did. I mean, he kicked the door open and said, there's a new sheriff in town. And, and it's like, yeah. And he's going to spend the money. Remember, he's worth $13 billion. That's he's exactly what I want yeah, a Mets owner to do. Yeah, well, that, that's the whole thing. Like, he, that's the one problem I have with his press conferences. He, he actually said, and I quote, you you build you don't buy championships you build them. No, the Mets kind of need a buyer. They need yeah, a buyer. They, but I mean, I mean, building things is nice, but have you ever bought something? Right, but that's something thing. really expensive. Well, that's the it thing. This, great, doesn't it? The Marcus Stroman, you know, eighteen million dollar offer. The the rumors about Lindor. That's not building a championship. That that's, that's buying. buying. That's you not. Know, we're Yankee fans. I am not diametrically opposed to buying stuff. <laughs> I right. like it. And they're trying to knock down the wall. As they said, we've heard the rumors of Trevor Bauer. We've heard the rumors of George Springer. We've heard JT Relamuto. Now, we hear rumors that 
the, uh, on the amount of spending that Steve Cohen wants to do, he's going to blow the Yankee payroll out of the water. Right. And by the way, on the uh, Marcus Stroman thing, I told you, you know, that he was going to offer it, and it wasn't a matter of whether he was going to accept it or not. Just the mere fact that he gave out that eighteen point nine million dollars as an offer, that to me was a statement. Because if it was, think about it. If it, that was the Will Ponds, you know they would not be offering Stroman that money. Nickel and dime. That it's not. It's not Fred and Jeff. It's nickel and dime. Yeah, but mm-hmm. the but the the Will Ponds were never going to spend money. First of all, this goes all the way back to the Madoff scheme where they got completely screwed by the money that they put in. They got their own players' accounts freezed by doing that whole situation. Mm-hmm. Now, with a guy like Steve Cohen who says. Tell me what the bill is. I'm going to pay. I'll pay the tax. I'll pay the luxury. I'm willing to do what it takes to make this team a competitor. Think about the ratings loss we had, partially due to COVID, but due to years before where the Mets were not competitive in New York. Once you have a Yankees-Mets rivalry again in Major League Baseball, the ratings are going to go, what? Sky high, rocket up. Right. And, well, this goes to what we had talked about, I think it was last week. The fact that all the owners are complaining and saying that they're not going to spend the money because of all the revenue lost, because of no fans, et cetera, et cetera. But then you bring in Steve Cohen. You know, this is not the Wilpons who are complaining about losing money. This is a fresh new owner, fresh money. He has set himself up in a big situation coming in at this point where all the other owners are trying to make up for losses. It's, again, the term fresh money, and it's like, you know, it's the shiny new toy, and all the players, if he's willing to spend more than all the owners, who's not to say that a bunch of those players, if not all of them, are going to go to the shiny new toy? And the owners, on top of that, they're going to have a reputational issue now because, the, like you said, the owners were not willing to spend. If Steve Cohen comes in and spends... If the, the Mets are stunting on you, I mean, yeah, that, that, that really does... I mean, in terms of recent reputation of the Mets, he wants to turn that around so the Mets aren't the laughing stock anymore. He so. should, though. And what's ironic, and I'll bring it up, it has to do with the Mets, actually. Do you remember, I don't know if it was when they were trying to sell the team the first time, Mark Cuban was one of the rumored guys that wanted yes. to buy the Mets, and Major League Baseball rejected it due to their BS reasons for why they didn't want him in the league? Well, think about it. Steve Cohen is a is a n- nicer version, I guess, of Mark Cuban with more money. A less, a less rabid, less – well, we call Mark Cuban the fan owner. And Steve Cohen is – he is a fan, but he's not as rabid of a fan owner as yeah. we, Mark Cuban is. Mark well, Cuban is what happens when you give a guy in the bleachers billion, billions of dollars and then say, yeah, hey, you want to buy the team? Yeah! <laughs> well, let's not forget, and this is really cool about Steve Cohen. Steve Cohen is from Long Island, and he's a Met fan. Right. So you're, you're getting a legitimate guy who wants to run the franchise and is, not, and is not treating it like an albatross around his neck or just a tax shelter. Correct. So let's – I think the Mets are going to be competitive. Now, the one danger you have with spending all this money is that what could happen? You're going to get flops in some ability, but you don't know where they're going to be. And, I mean, we, the Mets have a history of spending and getting flop when they do spend. I'd be nervous, like for a guy like Trevor Hold Bauer. On. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, Trevor Bauer uh, would, would make me nervous. Carlos Delgado. But I was going to say Trevor Bauer, who is going to want twenty plus million dollars a year. JT Relomuto from the catcher position is going to want $20 million. Again, I was going to say $200 million for a catcher. Hey. For a 32-year-old catcher. Hey. Well, well, I can go to the rumor and say that the Yankees are looking at Yadier Molina uh, for a two-year deal. And, and they might trade Gary Sanchez. But we're not going to talk about – Nick, we're going to keep your head on straight. We're not going to talk about that today. But it I mean, hurts. I mean I'm not, I'll, I'll quickly say this on the Yankees. I'm not opposed to trading Gary, and I'm – I like Yachty, but why? Why Yachty? Why not Higgy? Yeah, well, I mean, I think he's Higgy. Yeah. Why? Why? <laughs> why? All right. Do we have any other baseball stuff? Oh, uh, very quickly. Yeah. Jeff, yeah. Jeff Lundhow is suing the Houston Astros for uh, pretty much, the, he's accusing them of using Jeff himself as a scapegoat. 
This he is kind of apparently their human shield, and he's taking. He, not only is he taking this to court, he's taking the Shaggy defense to the highest law in the land. Yes, I was waiting for it. Yes, I love it. Wasn't, it wasn't me. It was him. They did it. Well, I mean, you know, you we can mock Jeff Lunhow all we want, but at the end of the day, baseball screwed up by not punishing any of these players. Oh, well, absolutely. What's ironic, and Nick and I talked about this on an episode of uh, a few episodes back. It's kind of ironic that he's now crying foul for being part of the situation when allegedly he was part of that situation between the Astros and the Cardinals when he was in the Cardinals organization. Mm -hmm. And then he, and he left for the Astros and allegedly, because I don't know the whole situation, uh, apparently oh. took the logins and the passwords for right. the Cardinals. Right. I remember, I remember that. And, and let, I'll make it clear. Jeff Lunell does not have, you know, the, he does not have the halo and the wings. He is no angel. In yeah, he is. That that's that's why this insistence that it was not me, good sir, it really does hold about as much water as a paper boat. Right. That's I, why I, it's ironic, I, I, I I agree with that. And plus, remember we have Alex Cora, who was a part of this scandal, and then had another scandal the very next year with the new world, the the following year's world champion Red Sox. And well, then got his job back. Well, yeah, speaking of Alex Cora, since you brought it up quickly, uh, he's now the new manager of the Red Sox after taking a year off due to suspension. And somehow him and A.J. Hinch, who are now with the Tigers, right. have got their jobs back. Again. Well, I was going to say, well, the difference is A.J. Hinch, I mean, you're with the Tigers. That's like I think Nick put it best in a meeting. You've been you've been put to Siberia for Major yeah, League Baseball. You've been sent to the you've been sent to the equivalent of the baseball negative zone. And it is it is the Bermuda Triangle? You know, right. Yes, it is essentially Alex the, Cora, yeah, Alex, it is yeah. I was gonna say Alex Cora, meanwhile, yeah, maybe the Red Sox kind of suck after trading Mookie Betts away, but you're still in the most competitive division, arguably, in baseball. Yeah, it's a monkey's paw thing. Oh, you can get your job back. It's just, yeah. Well, we went from being uh, somewhat good to now we're the league of cheaters. So. Right, well, well, again, the whole point is, you know, Jeff Lunhow, Alex Cora, all these guys, AJ Hinch, they don't have wings. They deserve to be punished. They weren't punished enough. But the, it's more the fact that it goes back to what we were saying when this originally broke. The players were never punished. The true people were never punished. Yeah. All right. What, what do we got next uh, year? Very quickly, and one last baseball thing. Tony La Russa got arrested. Uh, uh, the new manager of the White Sox uh, arrested not too long ago for a DUI arrest. And now I didn't see the footage, but apparently, supposedly, he put his – he showed his, his World ring Series out. ring. He put his World Series ring out, allegedly, because we don't want to get in trouble. Allegedly put his ring out and said, I am a baseball Hall of Famer guy, apparently, to a cop. And – if, you know what? The man should never have come back to manage. You know what? I, I, I like Tony La Russa. He's going to be up there in the top five managers of all times and wins. He won two World Series. But really? First of all, first of all, the one thing you never do when you get arrested is pull the do you know who I am offense. The, the ultimate Karen move. <laughs> well, by the way, Nick, would this fall under the uh, the shaggy defense? It wasn't me also. No, oh, I, no, I, would say, he, I would say it's more of the I I, I would say it's more of the uh, the Alanis Morissette defense. It's <laughs> ironic that, uh, that Mister Yeah that Mister Law and Order decides to get loaded and drive the and get and say I can do whatever I want. That was yeah, good. Exactly. Like uh, okay, but number two, it's like and, rain. number two, and I agree with you, Nick, is that he should never have come back. He's in his seventies. He you know, we talk about going out on top. He did go out on top. The he's 2011, all the 2011 World Champion Cardinals, and he's he a Hall of Famer. The, right, he, the the MLB Hall of Fame did, was committee. upset. Right? Uh, like, what are you this doing? Is, this is going to be MJ in the, uh, on the Wizards. Yeah, I agree. You. This is going to be bad. Well, the, MJ, oh, MJ wasn't in the Hall of Fame. You can't be in the Hall of Fame in the NBA. Okay, but I know. But the point is that you know. Your he legacy should've... is secure right off into the sunset yeah, already. Exactly. And he had and if, don't I'm not sure where, but somewhere in MLB he had a comfortable job, if I'm not mistaken. Oh yeah. The, the cushy the cushiest of cushy jobs. He was and in that, a 
jobs. He had a consultant job with the Red Sox. I know he did that. And then he was working in the front office with Joe Torre at one point. Right. But my but my point is, and don't get me wrong, to the White Sox, White Sox, you're a hell of a freaking team. That was so much, so much young talent. You know, Jose Abreu definitely deserved the nomination. We can debate whether or not he deserved the MVP, you know, but at the end of the day, you know, Jose Abreu, Jose Ramirez, DJ LeMahieu were three great choices for AL MVP. Now. By the way, just before you finish that point, because I don't want to forget, uh, Rick Renteria got screwed in the he worst. Did. He and Tony La Russa is not the cure for what ails this team. Yeah, no, but my point is it's a young team. Why are we bringing in a 70? Isn't that the, uh, the opposite of the direction Major League Baseball is going in? And exactly. just to add one more point to this, and I know we're running short on time, he hates the bat flip which the White Sox are, and he's old-fashioned baseball. He likes sign-stealing. He came out and said, I do sign-stealing. This is not going to end well. Analytics. Okay. No, no thanks. I went to the bathroom this morning. <laughs> okay, very quickly, Mr. Morgison, you can have some NBA. Talk about this whole uh, situation that's going down in Houston. Apparently... Harden's committed, but Russell Westbrook says he's committed, but uh, may not be. As soon as I heard the story break, I knew. I knew. I knew. That's like Nick Morgison bait. So I reported this on our account yesterday, and I saw, or even two days ago. Two days ago, I think it was. And I, so I see the story from Woj and Shams, who are the top two NBA reporters, and they said, oh, Russell Westbrook wants out of Houston. And this kind of reminds me of the chicken and the egg when you have two stars who are too big for their bridges, a la, which is ironic because Russell and James Harden and KD were in OKC. They played well for a couple of years, and then the three of them kind of their egos grew so big that they couldn't stay on the same team when they probably could have won a few championships, but they took ego over winning. And I mean, yeah, I mean, it's kind of sorry to interject, but it's kind of nuts that. In my opinion, Maury goes over to Houston. I mean, over to Philadelphia, and we hear rumors that Philadelphia may want to trade with Houston to acquire James Harden. After all the so close yet so far theme of the Rockets, I, the Rockets again. It goes back to what we've said time and time again, and that ex- and something that we've been saying, a, a term we've been using since last month: good but not great. Well. The one thing I'll add, and it's interesting you bring up, and we've talked about this, the whole uh, Daryl Moore going to Philadelphia and you hear the rumors. I feel like that happens in any sport when a former GM goes to another team and then the rumors come out that that player could be traded to that team. I don't think the Sixers are going to trade for James Harden. Neither do I. And and, and I've said that the Sixers don't need to trade for James Harden. And the only way you're going to get James Harden is you're going to have to trade Embiid or Ben Simmons to make the cap space. People forget that the NBA is a cap space league. So to fit that contract, you have to trade a contract of similar or equal value to make the room. So for this to happen... It's like trashing your car because you want a 10-speed bicycle. Right. And... To go back to the Westbrook news, he wants out. That's a fact. I don't think that's a lie. I don't think that's a rumor. He wants out, and I think because he's not number one, and he's but he shouldn't be a number one because he's not a number one anymore. But you know what? This is inevitably leading to, right? Oh, come to the Knicks. I was just about to say that. I think he wants to be in I New can York. Fe- I can feel it in the wind, man. I can feel but- it in the wind like a chill up my spine. The Knicks are calling. Right, but I could see James Dolan. He's not doing this for for wins, losses, etc. He's doing this because he wants to sell jerseys and make up money. Mm-hmm. And so does Dolan. Look at that. It worked. That's, what I, that's, what I, that's who I said. No, that's what he said, yeah. yeah. I think Dolan is doing this clearly as a money oh, marketing. Me. And, I mean, could it help? How many more? He's 32. The problem is, and you're gonna hold your breath when I say this number, they would be on the hook for $130 million. And, and all for what? A guy, you know what this is going to be reminiscent of for the next? Oh, big Nick. <laughs> you know what it'll be reminiscent of? Having a guy like Stoudemire or Mello, in which, you know, maybe it will benefit the team a little bit. But if, I mean, the most that the, they would go would be first round playoff eliminations. Right. 
But one thing I want to add about Melo, as much crap as we gave Melo, Melo actually played halfway decent in New York. They just didn't put anybody around him that was halfway decent to play. Right, again, and I've, I've said this time and time again in our rants about Nolan and the Knicks, the, 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 t- the only most recent time in which the Knicks actually looked like a good team was when they had at the front of the team Melo and an aging 30-plus-year-old out the, nearly out-the-door Jason Kidd. Well, oh, well yeah. I guess the worst excuse you could say that they had was Amari Stoudemire, who ended up being an egotistical maniac. Right, but but again, that twelve that twelve to thirteen season, they actually made it to the final eight, which is well until J. R. Smith, until J R Smith screwed it up for the first time. Right. Well, I, I just I just said that's completely unnick like. Right. So I don't know. Could Russell Westbrook end up in New York? I think it's very likely, but well, there's other teams that are looking at it also. All right. Very quickly. Very quickly. Because this is just going to be a weekly occurrence, I think. Just consistent. Uh, this is COVID times 100 this week. Yeah. So, firstly, we had last week after our show, Notre Dame upsetting Clemson and them storming the field after the game. No one was wearing masks. Well, not nobody was wearing masks. I shouldn't go that far. But it seemed like a lot of people were not wearing masks. And you have the president coming out and being mad at the students. And then ironically, apparently something happened with the president. Like he had a previous instance of not wearing a mask or something. Didn't he I test don't. positive also? He may. I, I don't know those details. Allegedly. Yeah. But, but, but then in the cancellations. Oh, my God. Okay. So when we met on, I think it was Wednesday, the following games were canceled. Memphis Navy, Cincinnati, Tulsa, Army Navy, Alabama, LSU. And and now there's a lot more that have there's gone 15 on. Games. 15, now, 15 games. games. There's a game that next week that's already canceled. Well, I, I, through, through I, all of it, they were uh, through all of it. So many teams were having fans in the stands, and oh my god, how irresponsible is that? Well, the one thing I want to add is that they're not being canceled due to protocol. They're actually being canceled due to actual positive tests. Right. And this is a direct consequence of COVID levels rising in 49 of 50 states in this right. country. And, and Nick, I was going to say, to me, it wasn't so much about fans and not fans. But when you look at that thing, if you look at that Notre Dame game, there's, again, a lot of people are not wearing masks. There's no social distancing going on. It's irresponsibility. Tom, remember, I like, and we didn't mean to laugh it's at it. We were, la- we were laughing at it due to the, all the fans storming the field. When they knew not to storm the field well, during COVID. Well, everyone was having a field day with that afterwards. Like, ha ha, social, no social distancing. Here. And even, the, but, but even the even the chancellor came out and said, "Don't do that." Right. Put a, put a friggin' fence up! God damn it! No, you, no, you. The speculation that I heard, and I, I don't know if they'll get away with it due to legal situations. But I apologize for the language. It's just no, very it's fine. But what I was going to say is, you might have to expel students if they don't follow the rules. You're, you, it's going to need to happen that way, but they're well, not going to do it because me, well, me no, yeah, we gets in the way of health all the time. You're going to have lawsuits if you start expelling yeah. people due to this situation, but that might be the only threat that would keep them from running on the field. That would keep people keep people's masks on and six feet apart from each other. All right. Anyways, very quickly, uh, Tom Izzo, even the college basketball world, Tom Izzo has a positive test. There's an Eagle staff member. Go moving on to the NFL. The Eagles. There's an Eagles staff member who tested positive uh, for the Steelers. Vance McDonald, I believe he is out. I know Big Ben. Yeah. Ben Roethlisberger was a close contact. This Ben Roethlisberger is kind of the Matthew Stafford situation from last week, but I believe they just reported that Ben Roethlisberger has tested negative throughout this week. He is active. He is good. He is ready to go tomorrow for the Steelers game. Uh, Bengals defensive tackle Marcus Hunt. He was a case. And now today they announced that the Bills have several players, like three or four players who have been put on the list. And I have the names more. here. If you okay. Want. Yeah. So, well, I have one because that was the name that was important. So Josh Norman is the guy that tested positive, the cornerback. And on top of that, they took three guys uh, due to contact tracing. So it was Tyler Croft, Levin Wallace, and Dean Marlowe all out Sunday versus Arizona. But – Josh Norman is the official. It's a big name, yeah. That's a big blow to the defensive uh, unit. Also, uh, just a brief mention here. There's a Penn State running back. 
uh, I forget his name sadly, but he was going through a routine uh, COVID-19 test and they found actually a heart condition through this test somehow. Oh, Journey Brown, Journey Brown. That's it, yep. Yeah, and unfortunately, Journey Brown's career is basically over. Yeah, due to the heart condition that they're saying that's coming from this COVID situation. Like, you know, I I feel so bad. Like, it's a tough. You know, going through, he's going through a routine test, you know, but it's a it's a routine test. Everyone is going through. All the athletes are going through these tests, and then all of a sudden, it's not a matter of you have COVID or not. It's now all of a sudden, you the thing the thing you love, the thing you came to college for, because he's at Penn State. I mean. And done, just like yeah. that. Take it away, like that's. This virus sucks. Like it, 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 2020 has been a year of shit shows. I'm sorry for the language, but that's what this year has been like. I'm I, I'm throwing it's up my tree a, next it's week. It's been a slow moving car crash on top of a dumpster mm -hmm. fire inside a tornado that is hurling racist insults at you somehow. I'm I'm putting up my tree next week. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 I am too, but uh, did we have any other things? Because I have one more thing if we want to add it. Uh, we got a rapid rundown we got to do. Okay, let me just add one quick thing because I forgot to do it in the NBA. So okay. Shams officially came out and said that the NBA is targeting December 11th to December 19th for the 2020-21 preseason. And teams have the option of requesting three or four games, and each team must host at least one home game. Again, you know, I'm glad to see – that you know, basketball is trying to find a way back. I'm glad to see that it's trying to push through. But 72, it, Chief. No, but I was going to say 72 games. Yeah, you're taking a month or two less, and you're going to try to do 72 games, a play-in tournament, and full playoffs. Well, yeah, I don't. I'm going to say the one buzzword. Yeah. I'm going to say the one buzzword: the Olympics, which no one cares about. No one's going to go to it. I, I know this. the NBA, if they ever decide to watch this, is going to say, what are you doing? And I said, because I'm telling the truth. No NBA player is going to the Olympics. Do you think they're going to travel to outside you the country? Do you think they're going to have an Olympics, first of all? Well, I was going to say, it's well, we don't know if they have or will, if, if they will or will not. You know, let's face it, 20, August of 2021 is still, what, eight, nine months away. We still don't know what's going to happen with COVID by that time. Maybe it goes away. Maybe it's still here. Maybe just a matter of that we got to learn to live with. I don't know. I'm not a for, I'm not a sightseer. I think COVID is basically the new flu. Like the, you have a flu season, you're gonna have a COVID season possibly. I agree. Oh God, don't say that. No, oh I'm not. God, don't say it's that. Not that I want it. It's un, It's just the unfortunate of the situation. I agree. We will have to live with it. But my point is, you know, we don't know whether or not there is going to be the Olympics. I understand wanting to try, you know, just in case. But again. They're saying they're going to get everything done by mid-July. I don't know about that. And I know we're really running over, but the Warriors are spending a million dollars to test people every day so that they can come into the arena. And and their plan, by the way, and hold your breath on this number, they want to have 50% capacity inside their arena during the season. I thought the NBA said they were only have like 25 for all the teams. They're saying that they're going to have 50% capacity somehow. So I don't know. What is this? Trying to be, they're trying to, you know, flex their muscles. Oh, we're the Warriors. We're the NBA dynasty. Yeah. Warriors were the worst team in the NBA last season. See, when you, when you, when you, when you look up the definition, the dictionary definition of famous last words, that's it. <laughs> All right. You'll find okay. that there. All right. Very quickly, it's time for a rapid rundown. So we got the Bucks and the Panthers. I think Tom Brady's going to be a little mad after getting embarrassed on uh, Sunday Night Football. I'm taking the Bucks, yeah. But, yeah. Yeah, the Bucks are going to be angry, but it, I think McCaffrey is back. For or is he not? No, back? he's out again. He's nope. out again with another injury. Okay, the the Bucks are going to totally crap all over the Panthers. No Texans doubt. and the Browns. It's funny that the Browns are actually the better team right now. They had a the, COVID positive th this past week, right? They did, but we don't know the player yet. But they, they're dealing with that whole situation. When you have to deal with that whole situation, it scrambles everything you have to do. Yeah, but the Texans, man, they – you want to talk about crap in the bed? I'm going to take the bed. Well, is not funny? They're, they're facing the Browns and the crap in the bed. <laughs> there we go. So I'm taking the Browns. Wow. I, I'm gonna, how, I'm gonna, how apropos. I'm going to call upset as well. I'm going Browns. 
as much as I want to take the Texans because you would think that they have the talent, they haven't proven they haven't proven shit. No pun intended to me. So I'm taking the Browns, Eagles, and the Giants. Well, Giants fans, congratulations, we got our second win. Hey, you know what? You know what's the sad part? If the Giants win this game, they're like half a game or one game back from the lead of the division. The NFC least at its finest. Playoff, everybody. playoff implications for this game. For both teams that are above 500, pretty uh, below 500, pretty much tells you everything you need to know about this division. So that being the case, God, I I I had my moment in the sun last week where I said the Giants were going to beat Washington. This time I'm going to go Eagles back. Eagles has a better record. I'm taking the Eagles. I was gonna say I'm going to go back to reality. Even if the Giants were to take a lead in this game, we saw last time that very easily, and you can look at the history of these two teams. The Giants can choke it away. I'm going to go. They, can, they couldn't actually defend against the paper airplane, much well, less much less a pass rush. No, I the mean, defense has been doing good. It's a matter of some. Danny is not effective. Again, I'm saying it. Danny. Let me throw, let me throw two things at you. Okay, maybe this will influence the decision. Okay. So, Defonte Freeman is out. Yeah, but you know what? Wayne Gallman and all them are have been proven to be better running backs than Devonta Freeman. Yeah, but he's been a little banged up as well. Also. Yes, right? but like, they but didn't. It, they didn't have him last week, and they still won. No, no, exactly. No, Gallman's been a little bit banged up as well. Well, so. again, I agree, but Gallman's done a lot more than Freeman has done this season. And I'll throw one more. You saw the Golden Tate situation, right? Yeah. Yes. But again, yeah. again, screw Golden Tate. And again, last week Ouch. they didn't have Golden Tate, and they won. Well, I'm I, I'm with the Eagles just because I think the Giants can't. Uh, what's the saying? Pull lightning in a bottle. Or out of the bottle. Oh, yeah. speaking of Washington, Washington's playing the Lions. And guess what? Now, the Lions, of course, are in a whole bunch of controversy. Apparently, Matt Patricia might just be finally on the way out. It's about uh, time. I agree. But you know what? I think Lions are still a much better team than Washington, so I'm going to go Lions. They are. I'm taking the Lions, too. I don't know. Do you think Washington can pull out lightning in a bottle also? I would hope not. I, no, I mean, that, that, that's not lightning. That's just a really loud fart. Uh, <laughs> with a, with a really, bright, uh, really uh, bright flashlight. Okay, so the lines aren't that much better. Three and five, Washington's two and six, but wa Detroit's still a three and a half point favorite. Well, Washington's quarterback situation is a disaster. I like Alex. Also, Detroit's the Detroit's the home team. And that's being nice, by the way, saying that Washington's uh, quarterback Situation is a disaster. I, I love you, Alex. I'm glad you're back. But, uh, it, it's going to be the Lions. Even though Stafford's been on and off the COVID list, It's the Lions are going to win. Okay, Jaguars and Packers. And the Jaguars now have their young rookie quarterback. But, Can we uh, say you, this on three? Because I think we know where we're going already. I say, you're playing in Lambeau. So okay. One, okay, uh, two, two, three. three. Packers. Packers. <laughs> Okay, the Chargers and the Dolphins. My heart is breaking for Justin Herbert. He puts in these massive performances, and his team cannot get him a win. You know what's so great about this game, actually? And I was listening. Say the Chargers. I was listening to a lot of the different sports talk radio, and they were saying this is the judgment game because the Dolphins had a choice between Tua and Herbert, and now you're going to see which one is going to rise. This to is the getting, who's going to win the game, Justin or Tua? And I think Herbert, by the way, is the rookie of the year. That's just my call right now. I want to agree with you, but the Chargers cannot win any games with him. Yeah, but how many times have we seen? Oh, I, I get it. But the stat line, I agree. Yeah. But it's the matter of is, you know, is the team going to affect that stuff? Well, wait a minute. This is the whole A-Rod uh, situation all over again in Texas where they were a terrible team, and he hit 50 home runs a season. Exactly. So, And honestly, we're going to continue that because I'm going to go with the Dolphins. I think they, the Chargers are just an absolute choker of a team. I have no faith in the Chargers outside Dolphins. of Herbert. I, in this case, I think he's the better quarterback, but I think you're I right. Agree. In this situation, Tua has looked good. The first couple times out. Mm -hmm. Sorry, Beard, but you're out, Mr. Fitzpatrick. I think it's time for you to move on and retire or whatever. Or or go to your 10 millionth team, which you're probably so, going to so, so you're picking the Dolphins? I'm picking the Dolphins. Okay. Bills and the Cardinals. Yes, so the Bills lose Josh Norman. So that's really bad. The Bills lose a couple more pieces. Yeah, they're going against Kyler and DeAndre Hawkins. And Kyle and DeAndre Hawkins are on the home team. I got to go with the Cardinals on this one. 
Cardinals. The Cardinals, and I, you guys heard me say it. I'm huge on the Cardinals this year. Like I, I think they're going to go far if they. Can I, just... I was a little worried. I was a little worried, but you know what? Kyler has definitely improved from last season, and he has a a, a great wide receiver unit. And even with Kenyon Drake out, Chase Edmonds has proven that he is just as good a second running back. So I'm Cardinals by <laughs> Cardinals by. I don't want to say a lot because the Bills are still a good team, but not looking good. Yeah. Okay, Broncos yeah. and the Raiders. So, gentlemen. The Raiders are going to be a little bit of a tough test, but Drew Locke over the last few weeks has – he's proven himself quite a bit. I'm going to upset the sock puppets and take the Broncos. Yes. Oh, at home again. Uh, the Raiders being the home team you're taking. Yeah. The uh, you, know, you know what? i got to have a little fun. So, you know what? Yeah, I'm going to upset the sock puppets, puppets too. I'm going Broncos. Yeah, the Raiders kind of concerned me. They had that whole situation where their – what was it? Their offensive line all went on contact tracing on the COVID list. Yep. And John Gruden doesn't know how to follow the rules. and gets fined a quarter of a million dollars and deals with that whole situation. Yeah, I'm taking the Broncos. Well, what can you expect? The puppets told them it was safe. <laughs> okay, the Bengals and the Steelers. You lied to me. Bengals That's and the Steelers. What, what are you going to do about it, bitch? <laughs> As as we just mentioned before, it seems like Ben Roethlisberger will be good to go in spite of not practicing all week. So you have that going for you. But they're, you still, have, they're still unbeaten. So still I'm unbeaten. The, and the Bengals, again, are another team. Well, they actually have proven that they can get wins somewhat. But again, another team where you got a good quarterback and some questionable pieces around him. Joe Mixon, once again, out, by the way. Uh, so Gio Bernard is going to get the lion's chair, and he's done well. For you fantasy people, man, I don't know about you guys, but I might not jump, draft Joe Mixon ever again. Yeah, don't. That's. Uh, <laughs> a, by the way, I feel bad for Burrow now because when he said that he was uh, a little acquiescent about going to uh, Cincy, now I can understand why. Apprehensive. Apprehensive, yeah. Whatever. But I, I think the, the streak will continue. I know the Steelers tend to play down to their competition, but the streak will continue. Yeah. Yeah. All def- right. Seahawks and the Rams. Very interesting game. You got Russell Wilson, arguably the MVP of this season so far, taking on a very tough defensive unit in the Rams. Who's, um, the Rams are the home team here. I'm going to take the. Uh, hmm. I'm going to take the Seahawks. I think I, I, say, I think the Seahawks offense is going to be enough to go. I think, I think the Seahawks are upset about last week. Uh, yeah, that too. That too. And that too. I think they need, they're like, okay, we're going to come out and crap all over the Rams and like score 40 points, I think. Mm-hmm. And uh, right. yeah. 49ers and the Saints. Now, the Saints blew out the uh, Bucks last week. The 49ers are pretty banged up, but 49ers, even when they're banged up, have pulled off a couple of surprises. But will they hear? I mean, I don't know. Is there a cat in that? Yeah, is there a cat in the hat? I don't know. I'm going to play it safe, though. I'm going to pick the Saints. I'm going to pick the Saints, too. There's no playing it safe. The Saints are obviously the better team in this situation. <laughs> Sunday night football, the Ravens and the banged-up Patriots, who, by the way, nearly lost to the New York Jets last by week. By the way, a couple years ago, this would have been primetime television. Mm-hmm. Now, no one cares. I mean, I would say you have the Patriots who nearly lost to the Jets last week, and then you have the Ravens who... Let's face it, I I hate saying it, but Lamar Jackson has regressed this year. Oh, yeah, big time. I'm but, taking the Pats. Mm, I, I, I still have a lot more question marks on the Pats than I do the Ravens, so I'm going to go with the Ravens. The Pats are concerning to me. Cam Newton is getting knocked down all over the place, and he's in neck injuries everywhere. I just – yeah, Ravens. All right, Monday Night Football, the Vikes travel to Chicago to take on the Bears. Da Bears. I'm going to take the Bears. Unfortunately, Dad, I'm going to have to take the Bears. You're, talk- you're talking about a, st- a strong defensive unit, but it has been shown to be very vulnerable at times. And but still, Kirk Cousins can't get out of his I mean, own way. You know what this is? This is defense versus defense. Let's call it what it is. There's no offense coming out of this game. Are you kidding? No. <laughs> the question An is astonishing who's- three to three tie. Exactly. Um... But you know what? Yeah, I do have more faith in Foles somehow. 
I don't know, but then again, Foles nearly got benched for Trubisky again. Yeah. Man, Foles versus Cousins. What Good the Lord. Did someone lose a bet? <laughs> yeah, ESPN lost a bet. Oh, okay. Yeah, I mean, that sounds about right for the $2 billion that they Yeah, paid sounds about right. All right, let's answer it. Bears. Uh, you guys Bears. are going Bears? All right, I'll, I'll go with you guys, Bears. Wow, the two Vikings fans uh, in the room didn't pick the Bears. Look at that. Hey, I, hey I'm a Vikings admirer, Invite. only because of my father. Oh, my God, I just realized this Thursday night football matchup, and I want all of it and then some. Oh, man. Ooh. Oh, my Ooh. God. Ooh. Ooh. Just back-to-back -to -back tough games for the Cardinals also. Yeah. Um. Oh. Is this a trap game for the Cardinals? I – possibly yeah. here's, the, here's okay. the thing i'm gonna go with the seahawks not in that the cardinals are bad but the seahawks are the home team so they're gonna it's gonna you know seattle's one of the toughest places to play and russell wilson is looking like the mvp of the season so i'm gonna go with the i'm inclined i'm inclined to agree with you tom so I'm gonna, yeah yeah i think russell westbrook is the mvp of the league no doubt no wilson. one is in <laughs> oh god because <laughs> we've been saying both names oi Wilson. Russell Wilson. <laughs> he's it's such not. an MVP. He's crossing over into other leagues. Yes. It's Russell very Wilson. rare that he's in both Russell Wilson in an episode. He's going to be the MVP without anybody getting near him, is what I meant to say. It's been he's a Paul long time. Jackson. What? He, uh, I'm sorry. He's Deion Sanders. Oh, okay. Sure. But I'd yes, like to, Seahawks. They're going to win. Yes. I, I'd like to solve the puzzle. <laughs> Love Mar and Bo Jackson. <laughs> Oh, God. oh, my God. Okay, we, we got to end this episode. It's too long. Okay. Uh, for Nick Morgison and Nick Federa, I'm Tom Albano. The answer is, when we'll see you again? The answer, what is next week? Till then, good night, everyone. Good night, everybody! Good night.